Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Cheryl Dawn, an assistant professor here at Bowling Green State University in the history department. So um, today I want to do something a little different and talk about what inspired us to get this podcast started and what really it's all about. So I'm here with my fellow collaborator and partner in crime, Dr. Emil Karshalou. Hello, Cheryl, and hello, everyone. Welcome to our podcast. Yeah, so this project has been almost a year and a half in the making now. Um, I think we kind of had our first conversations about it in the fall of 2022, right? Yes. Uh, you know, I've always been really excited about how humans experience the big forces of nature. When I found out about the 2024 eclipse, I thought this might be a good opportunity to tell a story that might interest people in Ohio and really everyone who will be viewing the eclipse. Well, I have to admit that when you first came to me with the idea of doing a podcast about the history of eclipses, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, before this, I'd always kind of thought of eclipses as these natural phenomenon. I think the only eclipse I'd ever thought of in a historical context was uh, Tecumseh's eclipse of 1806, which incidentally was the last total solar eclipse mm -hmm. here in Ohio. Um, can you walk us through what you were envisioning and the stories that you wanted to tell about eclipses? Yeah, of course. The original idea was to really trace the path of totality. That means the geographic path along North America, where people will be able to view the total solar eclipse. Uh, that it's still going to be in total darkness for a few minutes while the moon is covering the sun. The path of totality in this eclipse starts in the Mexican Pacific and ends in the Canadian Atlantic. And it passes through what we sometimes call the heartland of the United States, including Ohio. I thought at that time, I mean, wouldn't it be cool to see in the eclipse a common thread that links the histories and common astronom astronomical knowledge of the people living along the path of totality? The moon and the sun unite us as humans across borders. That knowledge of the stars, air quote, meant scientific knowledge, air quotes, uh, but also indigenous knowledge, the knowledge of the First Nations that inhabited and inhabit North America. How different are these forms of knowledge? That, that was the question. You know, when I was, you know, thinking about indigenous reactions to eclipses that have been depicted in our mainstream culture, it's always been kind of cloaked in this mysticism and superstition. Probably the first thing that came to mind is uh, Mel Gibson's <laughs> now infamous movie, Apocalypto, which uses this eclipse to foreshadow the fall of the Mayan Empire and the arrival of the Spanish conquistadors. And what really kind of struck me about that depiction was the dehumanizing gaze we got of kind of indigenous peoples. And that was surprising because, of course, the whole film was in Yucatec Mayan, but there was this clumsy attempt at depicting um, the local Mayan as superstitious and bumbling, and then the elites, the empire, to be barbaric and inhumanly cruel as well as superstitious. So I really wanted to avoid falling into that big stereotypical trap of, oh, look at these ignorant people who don't know anything about science. Exactly, yeah. Uh, we really wanted to highlight uh, what was that there were different ways of knowing, different ways of thinking about science even. We're often told that there's one objective truth, one way of seeing the world, and that's through this kind of cold and scientific lens. And of course, that's not true. There are many ways of knowing the world and producing knowledge about astronomy and other scientific fields. I mean, when, when we look at the stars, from a Western perspective, we might see constellations that are familiar to us, the Big Dipper, Orion's Felt, things like that. But you can also look at the sky from, a, I don't know, maybe a Shawnee perspective, and you would see totally different constellations, but they will still be constellations that work within their cultural context. What we wanted to do was showing that eclipses had these effects on the world beyond just a natural phenomenon. Eclipses are like super-loaded manifestations of the universe. We wanted to look at how different cultures have reacted to eclipses of the past and how eclipses have shaped the history of this continent. Through the eclipse of 1806 that you mentioned, for example, or the eclipse of 1791, which had a huge impact on American conquest of the Northwest Territory here in Ohio. 
At the same time, we wanted to respect and give space for different cultural traditions around eclipses and interrogate how we produce knowledge and how we decide one way of knowing is better than the other, how we make that, that, that call. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and really, now that I think back on it, that's like a heck of a lot to accomplish mm -hmm. in one podcast series. Um, so how did you approach balancing all of those goals? Well, let me bounce this back to you, actually, because uh, I think one of the most interesting aspects of this was uh, that uh, we designed this as a podcast season rather than as a story in just one soup. And I felt that the turning point in designing that narrative arc of the season was when you suggested the name for the series, right? Eclipse in History. So that, that's like a eureka moment that we have. What, what were you thinking about? Well, we were bouncing several ideas connecting um, not only the different peoples of North America, but also different time periods. We like the idea that this was not just a history of eclipses or something passive, but um, something you watch, but something that you kind of really experience, right? Something that you become a part of. And sometimes even something that's big at a continental scale, like uh, Tecumseh's Rebellion. So eclipsing history serves as a reminder that this is not the history of an event, but the history of an experience. And then the idea was to weave different experiences and different layers of experiencing in each mm -hmm. episode. Our first two episodes deal with the eclipse of 1791 and 1806 and their monumental influence, not just in the expansion of the United States in these lands, Eclipse and Conquest served as a way to explore the connections between our knowledge of eclipses and power. Yeah, and this led to the issue of how much knowledge indigenous peoples had of cycles of the moon and the sun. Uh, episode three is a deep dive into indigenous storytelling and how they encode and pass knowledge about stellar cycles and how that makes makes uh, and how that helps make sense of the world right something that surprised me here was not just the sophistication uh, that they showed in in this ancient indigenous knowledge such as the hopewell cultures that created the mounds in ohio but also how connected that knowledge was with their lifestyle to understand the sky is also to understand where you're going in the dark which is an important skill in societies that are constantly on the move mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that connection to lifestyle is what gets us to the issue of eclipse tourism in episode four. So imagine how crazy it would sound to someone living in, say, the early 1800s that people would be moving, would be traveling thousands of miles just to join a watch party for a total eclipse. And episode four brings up how the development of eclipse tourism owes a lot to technology, um, such as photography and other instruments of observation. And it has, in nowadays, really become an industry. You know, all over Ohio, we expect hundreds of thousands of visitors for this total eclipse. And our mm -hmm. museums, our science centers, our cities, our stadiums and universities are all organizing these eclipse parties. Eclipse parties, that's so, so new, right? I mean, our final episode gets us back to eclipsing as something that unites us as humans throughout history. This time, we're looking at emotions as that unifying thread. I mean, experiencing an eclipse, it's, it generates unique emotions. To do, we do, we do watch parties, right? But episode five shows us a range of emotions, screams, banging pots to awaken the sun, fear, and also awe. Even among scientists, there's a lot of emotion involved. We interviewed scientists whose eyes sparked when we talked about their experiences. Scientific observation blends into some form of contemplation and a humble sense of awe of being like a, a particle in a universe that it's so big, a desire to be immersed in this experience. So we sometimes think of emotions as something individual and out of history, but it's, it's quite the opposite, right? Yeah. And, you know, for those of us in the history field, we often talk about there being a history of emotions, a history of how people feel and how that changes over time. 
But uh, let's let's not spoil the podcast for our audience. Yeah, no. But before we go, I want to recognize the work and planning uh, that went into producing a project of this scope. I mean, we interviewed people from Canada, Mexico, the United States. We interviewed world-class astronomers, tradition bearers, and teachers from First Nations. Um, and we interviewed historians of art and science, leaders of Ohio's cultural organizations that are planning events for the big day. And it was just like so overwhelming to, I think, have all these people participate. And it's, it's like a f truly a feeling of, of gratitude to our interviewees who have been gracious in giving their time, their knowledge. Uh, and it definitely that knowledge shaped the scripts and the episodes that, that you're going to see today and in the coming weeks. Uh, beyond our interviews, we also have many other thank yous, right? Uh, so first, a big shout out and thank you here to Higher Humanities who supported this vision for this podcast and have been integral in financially supporting the grant. It wouldn't be possible without their support. And this wouldn't have been possible also without the absolutely phenomenal work of Becky Brown, our outreach coordinator here in the Department of History, who did a lot of the background work, arranging interviews, things like that, even stepping in to conduct an interview uh, late in the fall. Yeah, and um, I'll also say that we have gotten so much professional help along the way, and we really wouldn't have been able to do it without that, right? So big thank yous here to Will Michaels at WUNC and Claire Roth at Ohio Newsroom, who worked with our students and gave feedback on scripts and various drafts. Um, we also partnered with MidStory, and they were really helpful in shaping the stories that we were telling, giving us directions, and helping us figure out what worked well in an audio format and what didn't. It, it does take a village to, to do a podcast, and, and also some equipment. Uh, the School of Media and Communication and the Center for Archival Collections were very helpful in giving us equipment and soundproof space. We even shut down the, the university radio for a few minutes yeah, so accidents. <laughs> sorry um yeah and i also want to state that at the centerpiece of the story are our students right um they rose to this task um and it's so heartening to see this new generation of storytellers in ohio that class that um you and i taught where this podcast was produced um is really where everything came together i mean we did our fair share of work behind the scenes to kind of prepare this but the actual production and really the creative direction was all up to our students. Mm -hmm. I mean, we gave them some research, some basic storyboards, and they took it and they just ran in their own direction. Um, through the interviews that they conducted and through these marvelous episodes that they produced and uh, created in every way. So a big shout out to our fabulous podcasting history class. Uh, I wanted to say that, you know, if telling these diverse stories about eclipses was the message of our podcast, our goal as professors was to create this unique learning experience, both for us and our students. And to that, we tried to give them as much creative freedom as possible, right? We discussed in our class issues of who owns the story, who tells the story. And I feel this class was truly a workshop in sharing authority over our podcast. It was a learning experience for the students, definitely, but well, I feel also for us. Yeah, um, and it was this like really tight production schedule. At, at times it was like, oh, are we gonna get this done? Yeah, couldn't think of a better group of students to have done this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they just went above and beyond, I think, in every way. Um, so I think that's about it for our episode today. Um, thank you all so much for listening and tuning in, and I hope you enjoy our Eclipsing History podcast, which will be available for streaming on our website, bgsu.edu slash Eclipsing History. Um, it will also be streamed via Spotify. So this podcast consists of five episodes, including this one. Um, but also be sure to keep an eye out for some bonus episodes that we plan to release along the way. Thank you.